Chapter 11 King William's Later Wars 1. The Affairs of Wales William was now king over all England, but he had not yet won that lordship over the whole of Britain, which had been held by the old kings of the English. But it was his full purpose to win this also, as well as the rule of his immediate kingdom. But of course, neither the Scots nor the Welsh were inclined to give him any greater submission than they could help, and there was much fighting on both borders. The care of the Welsh marches William put into the hands of his earls. It was only on the borders and on the exposed coasts that he placed earls at all. Besides his brother Odo in Kent, and his friend William Fitz Osborne in Hereford, there was Earl Gospatrick in Northumberland to guard the northern border against the Scots, and Earl Ralph in Norfolk to guard the east coast against the Danes. But he did not appoint any earls to succeed Edwin and more care. Parts, however, of Edwin's earldom were given to two great Norman leaders, Roger of Montgomery, who became Earl of Shrewsbury, and Hugh of Avranches, who became Earl of Chester. Their duty, along with the Earl of Hereford, was to keep the Welsh march. They received vast estates and special powers, the Earl of Chester especially being more like a vassal prince than an ordinary earl. All these earls had much fighting with the Welsh, but they took much land from them and built many castles. Earl Roger especially built a castle to which he gave the name of his own castle in Normandy, Montgomery, whence a town and afterwards a shire took its name. The Welsh princes, moreover, were always fighting among themselves, and they were often foolish enough to call in the Normans against one another. So the English border advanced. At last, in 1081, it is said that King William went on a pilgrimage to St. David's, and about the same time he founded the castle at Cardiff. Of the three earls of the border, William, Roger, and Hugh, the last two outlived King William. But Earl William Fitz Osborne left England in 1071 to marry. Richildis, Countess of Flanders, and to try to win her county. There he was killed and was succeeded in his earldom by his son Roger, of whom we shall hear presently. 2. The First War with Scotland King Malcolm of Scotland had all this while given himself out as a friend of the English. He had at least promised them help, and he had at any rate given all English exiles a welcome shelter in Scotland. But as if England had become an enemy's country now that it was conquered by William, in the course of the year 1070 he invaded Northumberland and harried the land most cruelly, destroying whatever little the Normans had left. Yet nonetheless, when Edgar and his sisters came to seek shelter again, he received them most kindly, and after a little while he married Edgar's sister, Margaret. This marriage was of great importance in the history of Scotland, for Margaret brought English ways into Scotland and made many reforms, and for her goodness she was called a saint. From this time, the English part of the dominions of the King of Scots, namely the earldom of Lothian and those parts of Scotland, like Fife, which took to English ways, had altogether the upper hand over the really Scottish part of the land. No doubt this marriage made William look on Malcolm as still more his enemy, but he could not as yet avenge his inroad. The most part of 1071 he was busy at Eli, and in 1072 he was wanted in Normandy, where the affairs of Flanders made things dangerous. 
But in August 1072, he set out to invade Scotland by sea and land. It is to be noticed that Edric, the hero of Herefordshire, went with him. For we can well believe that now that William was really king over the whole land, Englishmen were quite ready to serve him in a war with the Scots, especially after Malcolm's invasion. But there was no fighting, for Malcolm came and met William at Abernethy, and became his man, as, since the days of Edward the Unconquered, the kings of Scots had ever been to the kings of the English. Thus had William won not only the kingdom of all England, but the lordship of all Britain, like the kings who had been before him. 3. Affairs of Ireland There is in truth some reason to believe that William sought for a lordship even beyond the Isle of Britain, such as the kings who were before him had never had. The English Chronicle says that if King William had lived two years longer, he would have won all Ireland by his wisdom, without any fighting. We cannot tell how this might have been, but it is certain that though William never had the rule of any part of Ireland, yet in his day England began to have much more to do with Ireland, both with the Danes who were settled there and with the native Irish. This showed itself in bishops from Ireland, coming to England to be consecrated by Lanfranc. This was admitting an English supremacy in spiritual things, which was very likely to grow into a supremacy in temporal things also. 4. Affairs of Northumberland As William came back from Scotland, it is to be noticed that he confirmed the privileges of the bishopric of Durham. He had just given that see to a new bishop, Walcher, from Lower Lorraine. The bishops of Durham came gradually to have great temporal rights, like the earls of Chester. Had all earls and all bishops been like these two, the kingdom of England might have fallen to pieces, as Germany did. King William also took away the earldom of Northumberland from Gospatric, and gave it to Waltheof, who was already Earl of Northampton and Huntington. Earl Waltheof and Bishop Walcher were close friends, but Waltheof began his rule by a great crime. This was killing the sons of Carl, though they had been his comrades at the taking of York, because their father Carl a chief man in the north, had killed Waltheof's grandfather, Eldred. This was the custom of deadly feud, which was common in Scotland long after. Gospatric went to Scotland, where King Malcolm gave him lands, but he either kept or afterwards received lands in England, and his descendants went on as chief men in the north. One son of his, Dolphin, seems to have received from King Malcolm a small part of Cumberland, namely, the land about Carlisle. This was not yet part of the Kingdom of England. 5. The War of Maine William's next warfare was on his own side of the sea. The city and land of Maine, which he had won in 1063, now revolted against him. The men of Maine first chose as their count Hugh the son of the Lombard Marquess Azo, because his mother, Gersendis, was the sister of their last count Herbert. But she and her husband and son did not agree with the citizens of Le Mans. So the people proclaimed a commune, that is, Le Mans should be a free city, as Exeter had striven to be. The whole land of Maine joined the citizens, but they were betrayed by the nobles, so that the story of Le Mans is like the story of Exeter. Then King William in 1073 crossed the sea, taking with him a great host of English, among whom there is some reason to think was Hereward himself. 
One is sorry to think that a man who had fought so well for freedom in his own land should go and fight against freedom in another land. But we may be sure that the English of that day were glad to fight with French-speaking men anywhere. With this army, William laid waste the whole land, and at last the city surrendered, and was, as usual with him, well treated. Le Mans lost its new freedom, but it kept all its old rights and customs. Then William made peace with Count Folk of Anjou, who also had claims over Maine. William's eldest son, Robert, was to do homage to Folk for the county. Thus King William won the land of Maine the second time, ten years after his first conquest. 6. William's Enemies At this time of his reign, William had to spend a great part of his time out of England. King Philip of France was his enemy, and Count Robert of Flanders, and Count Robert's daughter was married to Canute of Denmark which helped to ally two of his enemies more closely. But the strangest thing is that one German writer says that in 1074 it was fully believed that King William was thinking of an expedition into Germany and of getting himself crowned at Aachen. Another German writer, on the other hand, tells the story quite the other way and says that King Henry of Germany, who was afterwards emperor, sent to ask William's help against his own enemies. Either way, such stories show that William was very much in men's thoughts and mouths everywhere. And King Philip and Count Robert made a very subtle plot for William's annoyance. This was to plant the Atheling Edgar at Montreuil, in the land between Normandy and Flanders, he would thus be able to get together English exiles, men from France and Flanders, and volunteers and mercenaries of all kinds to trouble the Norman frontier. Edgar was now in Scotland with his sister, Queen Margaret. He set out to go to France, but was driven back by a storm. And then William saw that it was his best policy to win Edgar over to himself, so he sent for him to Normandy, and he kept him for many years at his court in great honor. 7. The Revolt of the Earls Meanwhile, a revolt broke out in England, which was not like the revolt of Eli, a rising of the English people against strangers, but a revolt of a few of the great men for their own ends. Roger, Earl of Hereford, gave his sister Image in marriage to Ralph, Earl of Norfolk, against the king's orders, which was in itself an offense. Then, at the bride, Ale, they began to talk treason, and to plot how they might kill the king and divide the kingdom. Earl Waltheof, too, was there, but it is not clear how far he consented to their schemes. On the whole, it seems most likely that he at first agreed and swore, and then repented and drew back. He went and confessed to Archbishop Lanfranc, who told him to go and tell the king everything. So Waltheof crossed to Normandy and told everything, and the king received him kindly and kept him with him. Meanwhile, the two other earls had revolted openly, but they found few men to help them except their mercenaries and a number of Bretons who were attached to Earl Ralph. Ralph, moreover, made a league with King Swegen for a Danish fleet to be sent yet again. The English, who might have risen for Edgar or Swegen, thought that no good was likely to come of a revolt like this, and they fought for the king against the earls. Earl Roger was stopped by Bishop Wolfstan and Abbot Athelwig. The Norman bishops Odo and Geoffrey went against Earl Ralph, who fled to Denmark while his wife defended the castle of Norwich against the king. The Danes under Canute came at last and sailed up to York, but they did nothing except rob the minister. 
Norwich Castle surrendered, the revolt was altogether put down, and those who had a hand in it were punished in various ways, but none of them were put to death. 8. The Death of Waltheof Ralph of Norfolk had escaped, and his latter end was better than his beginning, for he and his wife went to the crusade and died on the way. Roger of Hereford was kept in prison, some say for the rest of his days, but Waltheof, whose crime, if he had done any, was less than theirs, was in Normandy with the king, and seemingly in his favor. He came back to England with the king, and was soon after put in prison. He was twice brought for trial before an assembly of the great men, and the second time, at Pentecost 1076, he was condemned to death, and was beheaded on the hills near Winchester on May 31st. This was the only time in his whole reign that William put any man to death, except in war. And it is strange that William, who had forgiven his enemies, Waltheof himself among them, over and over again, should have dealt so much more harshly with Waltheof than with Roger and others who were far more guilty. It is said that Waltheof had many Norman enemies, his wife Judith among them. His earldom of Northumberland was given to his friend Bishop Walcher. The English looked on him as a saint and martyr, and believed that miracles were wrought at his tomb at Crowland. And men generally believe that after Waltheof's death, King William's good luck, which had hitherto followed him in such a wonderful way, began to forsake him. 9. The Rebellion of Robert And so it did, whether the death of Waltheof had anything to do with it or not. The very same year the conqueror suffered his first defeat. For some reason or other, he besieged Dole in Brittany, but he failed and had to fly. Then his son Robert got discontented, because his father refused to give up any part of his dominions to him. Robert went away, and tried to get various princes to help him. King Philip did give him help, and many of the young nobles of Normandy joined him. In 1079 Philip put him in the castle of Gerberoy, and William came to besiege it. In a sally, Robert overthrew his father who was saved by the Englishman Tokig, son of Wigod of Wallingford. But William could not take Gerberoy, and he was persuaded to be reconciled to Robert. Meanwhile, Malcolm of Scotland made another frightful inroad into Northumberland, and in 1080, Robert was sent to chastise him. Robert did very little, but on his way back he founded a new castle by the Tyne, whence the town of Newcastle took its name. Robert then again quarreled with his father, and went away into France, never to come back as long as his father lived. 10. The Death of Matilda William and his queen, Matilda, had lived in all love and confidence up to the time of William's quarrel with Robert. Then, for the first time, they also quarreled, because Matilda would send gifts to her son in his banishment, against his father's orders. A little later, in 1083, she died. Their second son, Richard, had already died in a strange way, while hunting in the new forest, and one of their daughters died while on her way to marry a Spanish king. But besides Robert, William's other sons, William and Henry, were living. One daughter, Constance, was married to Count Alan of Brittany, and another, Adela, to Count Stephen of Chartres. Another, Cecily, was a nun. Just about the time of Matilda's death there was another revolt in Maine, where the Viscount Hubert held the castle of St. Suzanne for three years, 1083 to 1086, against all William's power. The castle could not be taken, and at last 
William was driven to receive Hubert to his favor. 11. The Death of Bishop Walcher William had thus during these years to undergo several domestic losses and several defeats in war on the mainland, but his hold on England was as firm as ever. After the revolt of the earls there was nothing which could be called a rebellion, only a local outbreak, in which a local governor lost his life on account of one particular wrong deed. This was Bishop Walcher of Durham, to whom William had given the earldom of Northumberland. The bishop seems, as a temporal ruler, to have been weak rather than oppressive. He is not charged with wrongdoing himself, but with failing to punish wrongdoers. He had several favorites, both English and foreign, who did much mischief. At last, some of them murdered one Legulf, an Englishman of the highest rank in the country, and withal a chief friend of the bishop himself. But even these men he spared, so that the people believed that he had himself a hand in Legulf's murder. So when an assembly met to judge the case, the people, headed by the chief Englishman present, killed the bishop and all his followers. Then Odo was sent to punish them. But he took money and put innocent men to death, and again harried the land. This was in 1080, the year that Robert was sent against the Scots. This was not a revolt against the Norman king as such, but rather a riot, such as might have happened just as well under Edward or Harold if any earls of theirs had given the same offense. 12. Death of Canute of Denmark Thus there was nothing except the inroad of Malcolm to be called war in England after the revolt of the earls in 1075. But in William's last years, a very formidable attack on England was threatened. Canute of Denmark, who had twice sailed up the Humber, never quite gave up the thoughts of conquering or delivering England. When he himself became king, he made great preparations and was joined by his father-in-law, Robert of Flanders, and by Olaf of Norway, the son of Harald Hardrada. In 1085 Canute got together a great fleet, and William brought over a vast host of mercenaries to guard the land. But a quarrel arose between Canute and his brother Olaf, and the next year Canute was killed in a church by his own men and was called a saint and martyr. Thus the danger was turned away from William. 13. Summary We have thus seen how William, having gradually conquered all England, went on to assert the old lordship of the English crown over the rest of Britain. He could not, however, any more than the kings before him, keep matters wholly quiet on the Welsh and Scottish borders. In Wales, the power of his earls advanced. But King Malcolm, though he became William's man, remained a dangerous enemy. In England, there was no real popular revolt after the submission of Eli. The English generally did not favor the rebel earls, and the death of Bishop Walcher was a riot rather than a revolt. On the whole, the land remained quite quiet under William's rule. Beyond sea, Maine revolted and was conquered afresh, but after this great success came several petty wars in which William's good fortune came to an end. Yet when England was conquered, it came back again as the great preparations of Canute came to nothing. William had also his domestic troubles, the rebellion of one son, the death of another, and the death of his wife. And in all this, the men of the time saw the penalty for the death of Waltheoth.